welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and the producer of this podcast, Sarah Tori. My guest, Cedric Teton, the CEO and co-founder of Promite, talked to me about his product and how Promise can facilitate best coding practices and code reviews within teams. It can also help with team communications, onboarding new developers, learning, knowledge sharing, and much more. You can learn more about Promise at promise.com. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Cedric, and let's have a listen. Hi, Cedric. Thank you so much for joining me, and welcome to the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everybody and tell us a little bit about where you are and about your background? Sure. Hello, Sarah, and thank you for welcoming me for this podcast. Um, so my name is Cedric Tayton, I'm, uh, and I'm from France, uh, in Bordeaux, to be accurate. And uh, who am I? I'm a software developer. Uh, most of all, um, I worked uh, for uh, 15 years now in uh, in computer and science field in uh, software engineering, uh, mostly. Uh, I've done I've done my PhD thesis uh, for uh, from uh, 2011 uh, until 2014. Uh, in Bordeaux, I was uh, working in uh, various topic about uh, software quality, but more specifically about uh, managing how we can manage third party libraries. Uh, in software projects, so how we can migrate from uh, a library to another one and so on. Uh, so I work here yeah, for uh, 15 years now in software engineering. I like to code uh, as well. I'm still coding today, uh, even if I'm a CEO of a company. <laughs> I think I will uh, talk about it later. But um, even though I'm software developer today for six years now, uh, I work at uh, a startup called Promise. Uh, which is a software editor which is based in France. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of the company. And even uh, even if I'm the CEO, I'm still coding because uh, we're still in the developer ecosystem. Uh, we work at Promise in, on the developer uh, platform. Uh, so yeah, I really like uh, this uh, developer ecosystem. Uh, yeah. I've, <laughs> I'm studying in, in that field and uh, I founded a company in that field as well. Nice. So in, in just under two minutes, you uh, gave everybody a lot of great information, which I'm going to go back and uh, talk to you about some of the uh, the things that you've been up to in the past 15 years, but especially in the past six years uh, since starting Promise. Um, so you did talk about your uh, PhD thesis that uh, you were working uh, with uh, uh, fields like migrating from libraries to libraries or databases and things like that. Um and that was basically, from my understanding, from our previous conversation, was the uh, place where you started forming ideas about how can you improve some things. And that basically became the foundation of what Promise is today. Um, but going back a little bit, can you tell me why did you think, because as you explained a little bit about Promise, it's, it's a, a, a basically IDE editor and um not exactly an editor, but it kind of gives you a lot of customizable features that you can uh, help pair programming, code reviews, and things like that, uh, which we will get to in one moment. But what was the reason for you to come up with this idea that there was something missing and you wanted to fill in that gap of the missing thing that then became Promise? Can you talk a little bit about that and what you found through your PhD thesis? Yeah, sure. Uh, during my PhD, there was one important thing. Um, I discovered all the scientific uh, universe and all the uh, research environment. And uh, this was quite new for me because uh, as I was finishing my master's degree, I was expecting to work uh, in the industry. But I was curious to discover this uh, research environment and the academic world. And um, I wanted to understand what uh, we could do in, in research, in uh, especially in the software engineering field, uh, because I, uh, I was uh, expecting uh, to find a research field like uh, graph theory or this kind of thing. But this was not really my... Mm, my universe, you know, and uh, I really wanted to, to to find okay how we can work in in research in the scientific uh, uh, field, but still uh, having 
an, an impact in the industry. I really like to, to, to work on stuff that uh, can have an impact. Uh, and during my PhD, I've discovered the frustration that uh, sometimes you, you, you can do some research, okay? You, you, you can find some, uh, some insights, some discovering and, and, and so on. Okay, it's cool. Um, I wrote a paper. It was accepted in a conference and so on. I can present my work to uh, an hundred of uh, re researchers. Okay, it's cool. But then, uh, my work just remain in the state of the art uh, of the scientific work. And then I have to move on to an over paper and over work and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and it was frustrating because uh, I found I found we, we, we could go further and further and maybe uh, push a bit of a further our work, uh, build uh, maybe a tool and so on. And uh, from that point, um, I, really, I, I was really wondering, okay, what I want to do after my PhD. And uh, there is something which is quite um, frustrating also in France. I don't really know how is it in other country, but in France, it's very difficult to find um, a position in the academic world. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, challenges uh, because you need to, to, to travel a lot around the world, do some postdocs, uh, several postdocs, and then you, you need to, to fight to find a position. Uh, you don't know where you will find it and so on. And um, I was thinking this is very, very complicated and very difficult to yeah. <laughs> to, 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 to work in the in, in the academic uh, universe in France. Uh, so what kind of alternatives do I have? Because I could also work in the industry, but I really liked uh, what I was doing, uh, you know, and uh, working on the software quality and especially uh, how we can improve uh, the way developers are working together, how we can help developers to improve their coding practices. This is really this is something I, uh, I was enjoying. And my PhD was uh, finishing. Uh, and uh, what kind of solution uh, did I have? And uh, fortunately for me, uh, there was some, some kind of um, help, uh, some fundings in France uh, that support researcher to 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 move away their project from the academic world into the industry mm -hmm. and uh, this started in uh, 2014 and um, uh, from from this point i really changed my mind from uh, someone who was working in the research field to uh, someone who's going to become uh, an entrepreneur. And yeah. uh, from that point of view, uh, in 2014, uh, I, I, I understood one thing. Uh, okay, you like coding, you, you like to work on what uh, you are working on, but from now, there is one more challenge to solve. Is it, It's, uh, okay, what kind of problem do you want to solve? Uh, because yeah. I think... Each company, each software editor tries to to address this this topic, mm -hmm. and uh, from this yeah from this point um, we really started to work with my colleague to to uh, to figure out uh, on the software quality field what uh, could be improved and so on, and this mm -hmm. led us to to what is uh, promised today. Yeah, that's awesome. Really nice um, story to where you are now. Thank you. Um, and I, I understand that, um, yeah, the field of academics, it's actually challenging in most places, I feel. Um, and where I've been, there are challenges, you know, related to that. Not only you you want to see your research and your work to be presented and worked on in practical world and not just sit on a shelf of some kind of library or research center and just collect dust. <laughs> uh, I've been there. Uh, so you wanted to kind of have an impact out in the real world. And that's, that's really great. Um, and also what you mentioned was also, you know, funding and finding grants and things like that. I know there's a lot of um, challenges connected to that because you have to write papers in order to, um, you know, apply for grants and things like that to be able to move your research forward. And if you can't find the grant and, you know, what else, what, what's next? Um, so that's really great that you came up with Promise and what you just explained, which was how can we improve the quality of the code? And the other thing that you mentioned was communication between developers. How can developers work better together? Um, and I think that's one thing that has really been the topic of discussion, at least in my world, uh, since 
COVID happened because, you know, back in the days of offices and physical interaction, you can go to the office. And now a lot of companies are kind of going back to that setting, but most companies are not um, because there are a lot of cost savings related to that as well. You know, if you don't have to rent a physical space and if everybody can work from their space at home or whatever, there are a lot of flexibilities, a lot of savings um, that go along with that. So, but one of the things is when, we were in sort of office spaces and working together next side by side. And you can look at somebody's code. You can discuss the the, the quality of the code, the uh, format of the code and all of that stuff. But now that it's changed and you and I are talking in two different parts of the world and we have to connect somehow and communicate somehow. So that, that I think is a real benefit when you can actually still um, put into place all of those uh, code qualities and the the even the format that you want your code to be in, the style that you want your code to be in, you know, even the simpler things like that. And you can do it asynchronously from different parts of the world in different time zones and things like that. That I, I think it's extremely valuable. So with that, tell me a little bit about Promise. So you wanted to solve this issue of code quality and also communication. How did you go about it? And um what kind of solution or solutions did you and your team come up with? I totally do agree with everything you said just before. Um, and <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> when we started Promise, we spent a lot of time to this, to with um, with some CTOs, uh, developers, technical leaders to understand how they managed the question of of code quality, because every technical leader. Uh, as uh, among their missions, uh, they have this goal to produce and deliver source code and software that, of course, work, um, fulfill their business needs, but it needs also to be um, maintainable, uh, easy to test, and so on. And I think uh, the mentality has changed and evolved uh, over the past year because when we we're talking to companies around uh, 2014 and 15. We needed to 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 explain to a lot of companies why it's important to take care about the code quality. I'm still young, so I don't pretend to have uh, the full um, 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 sorry the, the I don't pretend to to know. Uh, what uh, what was before uh, 2014, the state of the art about uh, code quality and so on. But when we were talking with companies around 2015 about topics like uh, technical depth, code quality and so on, many people uh, were not aware about uh, the existence uh, of these concerns and uh, they were not convinced about the necessity to invest on this topic. They were living with uh, bad code, with a lot of technical debt, and uh, for them, it was not really a concern. And I remember we really needed to spend some time to explain why uh, having a lot of technical debt is an issue, uh, because it will, it will uh, make your delivery time uh, longer because developer will need to fight with the state of the code to understand it and make it, making it evolve and so on. And they really uh, had some troubles to understand that. Today is in 2023 is not really a problem for us because I think that everyone is aware that code quality uh, is very important uh, to consider and not especially yeah. about uh, the, our productivity, but because that's so I think all developers now, they want to join a company where teams take care about code quality because that's our work environment. And I don't think any developers want to spend uh, most of uh, their days with bad code <laughs> because yeah. at some point you want to leave, okay? Um, and, and you know, uh, at some point it will come to bite you <laughs> in yeah. really uncomfortable places, yeah. And uh, now uh, every company uh, faces the challenges to to recruit new developers. So mm -hmm. when new developers say, uh, I want to work in an environment where we take care about the code quality, uh, sometimes 
they change their mind and say, okay, maybe we should invest more. But today it's, it's less an issue for us to convince about uh, why it's important to invest in, in software quality. Yeah. And we also try to understand uh, why, uh, why it's difficult uh, maybe some some tools, some solutions are missing, and so on. And uh, what we realized uh, in 2014 is that many companies try to to use tools like um, uh, Sonar Cube, for instance, which mm-hmm. are great tools. Uh, let's make it clear: I'm I'm not going to to criticize the tool because uh, I'm I'm using I'm using it as well. But uh, many companies uh, add this uh, spirit to say, okay, we are going to set up Sonar Cube and we can now say we are doing software quality you know it's like we're good uh, to go are, yeah <laughs> you are you are just uh, setting up uh, jira and saying uh, okay we are agile or you're using jenkins and say okay we are you doing uh, some devops or testing or some, yeah, DevOps, exactly <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was not enough and um, we try so to understand okay uh, why is this company, uh, which are paying a lot for tools like uh, Sonar Cube, so uh, which belongs to a, a world family of, of code analysis tools, uh, uh, why these tools are not sometimes in-house and so on to to handle code quality? And one thing we we, we realize is that um, if we want to produce high quality software in a context where you have dozens, uh, sometimes hundreds of to- software developers, um, beyond any kind of tools you would like to deploy, the main core concept is to make sure that each developer in the company has understood and is aware about what should be the best practices to apply. So if you didn't, tr- if you do not train your developers about how to produce um, high quality code uh, you can set up any kind of tools you want um, you want to achieve your goals uh, yeah. so the root cause I would say sometimes of bad quality is is mainly a human factor and uh, most of the bad code we find on this earth I think most the, the main reason sometimes is that developers who wrote the code were not trained in-house how about code quality and most of the company think uh, oh but, but it's it's really expensive to to train developers to be uh, more productive and to write better code um, but it's not true what costs uh, a lot to company is not not quality uh, non quality so uh, yeah. the fact that, that 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 you don't invest enough on code quality this is something that will impact you a lot but okay. if you realize that by invest, by investing a little bit uh, on your developers train them uh, and improve their technical skills you will get an impact and you will get a return on investment in the next months so exactly. Our next, our main philosophy at Promise when we started uh, to work on this project was to say, okay, if we want to help developers, uh, if we want to help companies to deliver uh, high quality software, we need to take a different approach, or at least we, we would like to propose a concept, which is uh, we are going to improve the quality of your code by uh, improving the technical skills of your developers. Yeah, so that's that's really the root idea of Promise, and today Promise it's a knowledge sharing platform for software developers. So it's basically an ecosystem with, as you said, uh, extensions for IDEs and code review, and the idea is to help developers to share best coding practices, to to submit some new coding practices, to decide together uh, whether they should do this way or this way and so on. And so that we create valuable knowledge and reuse this knowledge among different teams and so on. Because this is another problem we wanted to address is that in, in, in most of the technical companies, they have some knowledge silos. Um, we work in agile teams. Okay, it's great. But uh, if you have uh, 20 teams of 10 developers who don't speak to each other, mm-hmm. that's an issue because yeah. every team is fighting, struggling with some technical um, concept and uh, and practices and how we can make these teams discuss together because we don't really have some agile um, pl- um, ceremonies for that. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's, it's really interesting, several points that you made right now, which was um, 
you mentioned that several years ago, it was difficult for companies to really understand the importance of code quality and uh, how much it was going to cost them down the road. And it's interesting because isn't that the reason why a lot of companies, when you go for an interview, ask for a coding challenge so that they can see how you're coding, how you're solving these problems. So it's 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 kind of funny to see that because a lot of times, and I remember the the frustration when you go and interview at a company and they give you this abstract coding challenge and you're kind of looking at it and you're like, I'm not sure what am I expected to do here? And, you know, so a lot of the times you want to see the code quality. You want to see that um, this, this individual who is coming in to possibly join our team, how are their skills? How are they going to fit in with the, with the team? So that's really interesting that, uh, that aspect of it at the beginning, but then later on, and I've been in, in that situation that you kind of look at the code after a couple of years and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm sensing some smells in here, but who wants to, you know, who wants to pick up the, the, the broom and start cleaning up and crickets? Because nobody wants to deal with that, right? Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to touch a code that especially wasn't written by them, or maybe they wrote it three years ago and they look at it and they, they're like, who wrote this? And you, <laughs> you go get blame and you're like, oops, that was me, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So that's really interesting. And and it's true because you, a lot of times as developers, uh, and I, I put myself in the category right now, because we do want to make things go forward faster. And a lot of times you have to uh, meet a deadline or you have to, uh, you know, have something to present. So you want to get through the code fast and you want to get through this, this feature as quickly as possible. And the my favorite phrase is let's do it now and look at it later and that later never happens because it's always yep. next monday right <laughs> and next monday exactly. never comes <laughs> <laughs> so that's the problem especially um, with teams uh, you know uh, we are using uh, uh wrong uh, the, the scrum uh, framework or these kind of things because mm -hmm. they were always trying to estimate uh how much time they're going to spend on each task and of course they were never they was they were always late and yeah. always in the rush and uh they didn't have any time to to think about code quality because they, they just mm -hmm. wanted to deliver deliver and so on and yeah. uh, and if, and uh, sometimes they was they were thinking okay maybe we should plan like a friday afternoon to clean our code or this kind of thing but i don't think it's a good idea because uh you you you, you have no excuse to produce bad code actually because it doesn't save you any kind of time uh yeah. so really what, what while you're doing is, it is, exactly yeah. So let's do it properly right now. Um, right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's always funny. It reminds me of the, the phrase, like, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And you, know, you just keep pushing it off. And you're right. And if we can catch these things early on or just do a proper job from the get-go, then you don't have to worry about it and you don't have to pay this price later on. And another thing you mentioned with the team of, you know, 20 teams of developers, each team has 10 developers and they're all fighting each other, working in silos. And as a product manager, I'm like, ah, oh, tingling. Cause you're like, how do you communicate then with the rest of the company? Because it's not just uh, in that silo of the group of developers that are working on the project. It will then cascade down to other teams in the company, other, um, you know, departments, if you would. And then will affect everybody else's job as well. Because when, we're looking at right now we're looking at code quality and we think well this only has to do with with the developers and it only has to do with their quality of project and so on but if you look at it if you have these uh you know technical debts if you have these things that need to be fixed and you're not giving it proper time and place to take care of it it will then affect the product eventually then it will affect other aspects of the company marketing sales customers and so on so it's not just something that is really particular to the code if you would but going back and talking about promise especially one thing that um i really liked when i looked at the um the website and saw some information videos and things like that uh, not just the code review part of it and pair programming part which is really important but it was the customization part that I really appreciated it because every company has their own different standards, right? And every company has their own different um, ways of determining whether or not this is code quality, right? It's It varies from company to company. So that part was really um, wonderful to see that you can actually customize it to how your team 
really wants to see this code. So can you talk a little bit about that? And it's not just in the code, but it's also in architectural overviews and patterns as well. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. As you said, uh, we really want to work in Promise with the custom coding standards. And uh, this is something which is quite, which was also quite frustrating for most of the companies because when you use a tool like SonarCube, actually you are uh, using some rules from the community, very generic rules about how we can write source code in Java and so on. But at some point you want to define your own custom rules uh, specific to your context and uh, how you can do to manage this kind of tools, uh, this kind of rules. and. That's where Promise comes in. And actually, uh, you mentioned one point which is interesting because even if within a, a company, you have sometimes several entities and with each entities, you have uh, different teams and sometimes teams uh, have also the autonomy to define their own uh, way of writing source code. And they have also the autonomy to, to define rules that might be different from other teams in the company. And actually, that's uh, an engineering um, direction you want to take or not. Uh, some uh, engineering managers sometimes they tell us uh, our target is to try to find a common way of writing source code, but we let the freedom uh, from some specific coding practices uh, for each different teams. And some other engineering manager uh, try to be more uh, Restrictful about how we can how we can write source code in the company, meaning that uh, the level of freedom and autonomy within each team is very different. We don't really have our word to say at Promise because that's the company um, uh, challenges and so on, and we each company wants uh, to address this problem uh, in their own way uh, but we really want at promise to make sure that each company each entity each communities of practice can create their own uh, coding standards indeed and uh, what we really wanted to to work is uh, at promise is how we can uh, decide together what should be our coding standards and the typical way to do uh, this is something also we observed when we started to to use to develop promise we, re we realize that most of the technical leaders sometimes try to, to write down some coding standards in some documentation like a wiki. Uh, typical tool we, we saw was Confluence, for instance. And there was this common pattern. And this pattern was, OK, uh, I started to write some documentation on Confluence about our coding standards uh, to initiate the process. And in my ideal world, uh, I will send the documentation to each developer. Each developer will read carefully everything I, uh, I wrote down and so on. But what's concretely happened is that uh, a technical leader write down five coding practices in a wiki, sends the link to the Slack, to the team and said, OK, guys, uh, I started to write down some coding practices we should follow. Everyone said, OK, great. And actually, nobody is going to read it. and uh, Two, two weeks later, the technical leader will update the documentation and so on and said, hey, guys, I, uh, I've had it with one coding practitioner. Hi, hey, cool. Uh, but we are in the middle of something. And, and basically, this documentation will get quickly outdated. And uh, the, the, the main problem here is that the way the information is created and uh, shared uh, is not uh, optimal because yeah. you can't just push down, uh, write down, sorry, some documentation, uh, said, okay, uh, I've, I've spent many hours to write down the way we should write source code and say to developers, okay, we should do now this way. Um, and all the developers the, would say TLDR, and I'm not yes. even bothering and, with this. Right. And most of developers will say, okay, but why? And what if I do not agree? And so on. And there is, I, I think, according to, to us, at least, we, we really wanted to have a different way to build together the, the knowledge base of coding practices. And we really want to find a way to, to help developers to be more uh, involved in this process. And that's a key concept in Promise because, as I said, we, we have some extensions that really help developers to say, OK, uh, if I'm writing down code in my IDE or if I'm doing a code review in GitLab or GitHub and so on, if I'm 
uh, working or reading a source code and I think, hey, this is not the right way to do. I, I think we should do it differently. We can easily catch it and push it to Promise. And uh, the idea with Promise is that we encourage team to have some regular meetings together at least once per month. And during this one hour meeting, the idea will be simply to review each contribution made by developers and each developer will present uh, his point of view, why he thinks uh, this or she thinks this is a good practice to follow and so on. And we discuss it together and we decide to validate it together. So we have a collaborative process of building a knowledge base. And this is something uh, according to us, which is very important, because if you just uh, write down some coding rules and push it, push to developers, and uh, do not involve developers in the process, maybe they won't find your rules legitimate, and uh, they can be also frustrated. And uh, yeah, yeah they, they they will kind, uh, I would say, give up the, the whole process because <laughs> they like to to find your content legitimate. And if you yeah. have discussed it together and said with your team, okay, we do agree to do it this way from now, this is a very different approach. Yeah, I think that that communication is extremely important. Um, and so once they then determine what kind of uh, coding practices they want to continue with with the team, and one of the things that I find really helpful um, with using um, a tool like Promise, which gives you the option to take a look at this code and, or gives you suggestions for that matter. You, you're writing a coding, a block of code and it would give you a suggestion, hey, um, maybe change this part of the code to this. It's more readable, it's more usable, or it's less verbose or what have you. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, extremely important, not only in terms of uh, communication with the current team, but also uh, with other developers that may join the team later on with the onboarding process. I think that's really important because a lot of times the challenge is that, especially um, for startup companies or for uh, even a, a bigger company where you have projects that are being pushed out constantly and you have release dates and you have very strict schedule. If you're onboarding a, a, a new developer, no matter the experience of that developer, they still have to be onboarded within the team. They still have to be able to understand what is this team doing and how they're doing uh, their code writing and reviews and so on. And I think this will help tremendously with them understanding, okay, this is what I'm expected of. This is what I'm supposed to do. And it kind of gives them the stepping stool to then be at the same level as the rest of the developers within the team. You mentioned, I think, uh, in, in our previous conversation, uh, about the UI of this um, kind of code reviewing or uh, suggestions, you, you mentioned, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, there was a there was a feedback button that they can kind of push on, or they, there's a UI that they can use to see um, how the changes are viewed, or something like that. Re refresh my memory because I I wrote a note and I don't <laughs> remember exactly the details. Um it's uh, it's really it's related with uh, what you just mentioned before uh, because the idea of promise is to create living coding practices and uh, why we say living because if we just uh, okay discuss together and decide about our coding standard and this coding standard just remain in an, in a knowledge base uh, we we could see promise as a kind of evolved wiki uh, because we just uh, change bring something new in the way we construct and build together the knowledge base, uh, even though it's more integrated to the developer ecosystem and so on. But what we call a living knowledge base, uh, it's the ability to make uh, the coding practices, uh, I would say, pushable to the developer. And the idea is how we can uh, push knowledge and coding practices to developers when they need it. And that's also a common pitfall and limitation with a wiki-based tool, because when you write down your code in your IDE, you don't want to have your wiki page uh, just beside you to, to, to see, OK, uh, am I writing the source code correctly and so on. So you want to make your knowledge actionable. And as you mentioned, we, we can, in Promise, we have a, a detection engine of coding practices. So we can define some uh, patterns uh, on the abstract syntax tree on the code, uh, going from basic regular expression to 
more advanced patterns with uh, same grip patterns, for instance, but it's more technical. But the idea is that we can let user define how we can detect the rule in the code. And once you did that, if you were able, because sometimes we uh, we talk about architectural rules and so on, which are very difficult today to automatize uh, with any kind of code analysis tools. But when you can do this, you will get as a developer feedbacks within your IDEs. So if you are writing a piece of code, uh, if you are not comply, if this code is not compliant with one of your coding practices, you will get a notification saying, "Hey, maybe uh, uh, you are not uh, writing the source code the way you should do." And also during code review, we have the same concept. So when you are reviewing source code, we can, uh, if you are using the Promise extension, you will get also some notifications on the lines that uh, contain code which are which is not compliant with your coding practices. And this is something which is very important uh, to, to, to help developers to, to be aware and uh, to know what coding standard should be. Uh, so it's very important that knowledge don't remain static in the knowledge base. And we have two main concepts for that. We have indeed all the automatic detection engine. And we have also, uh, just because you mentioned it before, uh, a specific module uh, dedicated to onboarding new developers. Because as you said, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, to make the developers productive on our, on our code base and uh, how we can learn from the knowledge base. So you can just read one coding practices one by one, but it's not very effective. I think uh, we can do much better. And so yeah. that's why we built a specific module which helps to, to learn new practices thanks to some um, learning uh, challenges and interactive uh, exercise within the platform. That's awesome. And one of the other things that I saw that was really great was, uh, in particular, I was looking into DDD portion of, uh, of um I, th I believe it was one of the um, educational videos that he had there, uh, possibly on the website itself. It was really fascinating to me because the idea of domain-driven design itself is a, a bit abstract when you first learn about it. And it's uh, a little bit hard to kind of get your head wrapped around the, the whole idea. But what I really liked was it was also possible within Promise to give those suggestions that hey, maybe you're using this code in the wrong context, for instance, or um, your bounded contexts are not specifically defined, or this is not within your model, you know, the, things like that. And I've, I found it so refreshing and helpful because, um, again, as somebody who is new to these concepts at the very beginning, it can be very overwhelming to to get to know it. So can you tell me a little bit about the use cases, for instance, for some of these patterns that are um, new to some developers and not so new to the rest of the team? And again, onboarding them or maybe helping the rest of the team to learn more about it and make better use of, uh, of their time and also the patterns. Yeah, sure. How can we use that? Yeah. Uh this is something we actually even do uh, at Promise uh, because we are using our own tool, of course. It's very important. It's your own dog food, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally right. Um, and uh, one thing that happens a lot is that sometimes, for instance, you, you mentioned DDD. Uh, re re recently at Promise, we introduced a concept from the clean architecture in our front-end source code. So it was quite new for, for us because mm. where we, we started to introduce concepts from DDD uh, and uh, hexagonal architecture on the back-end side. And uh, when we started to work on the front-end, we said, oh, okay, we can do something similar to the, to the front. And, the side. and so what, what, what usually happens uh, is that one developer uh, or two developers, but usually it's only one developer uh, try to investigate about the clean architecture architecture concepts and uh, bring some ID and implements of stuff in Promise. And once uh, these developers say, okay, I'm, I think I have the, I, I have found the right way to, to do it uh, in our source code, we encourage these developers to create some coding practices to push it in Promise. And during the next workshop, we are going to review some of the practices related to clean architecture. And so it's a good way for all, develop all of our developers to the team to understand each concept that has been added by this developer. And uh, 
what is really important and uh, it's typical use case that provide is if you are if you have written some source code which introduces a new concept if you don't share this concept to all of our developers how can they how can they be aware of that and uh, how can they understand this once they will go to to this code and and find and read their, their code and this is something we really want to 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 implement in developers' mindset. Um, if you have found something interesting, if you write down something interesting that might not be obvious for all developers in the team, and even less for new developers that we join the team in the next week, it's really important to to think: okay, how can I capture this information, this piece of code, this concept, and explain it to my team? And yeah. A tool like Promite is a support for this, but of course you have other ways to do. You can maybe uh, implement or simply uh, run some more programming sessions because it, it's also a, a good way to exchange information and knowledge among developers. But one common use case at Promise is, okay, uh, as as a developers or mostly as a technical leader, but um, most of all as a developer, how can I uh, share with other developers something which is an important concept in my source code. And I don't talk about writing on Slack a message, uh, 100 lines message about uh, what uh, what I've done and so on, because if you just send it, everybody is working right now. So yeah. if I see a notification with uh, four paragraphs, I'm, okay, maybe I will. I will I'll read it later. later. And as we said about the technical debt, <laughs> later never happens. And exactly. so uh, two weeks later, when the developer said, hey, uh, have you read uh, what I said? It's so did you understand? Nobody read it. And finally, you and it will just... get lost. Yeah. yeah. I mean, finally, you, you, you will just spend some time uh, talking with other developers and all your team to explain what, what, what you've done. So just, yeah. just do it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, when, when there are some important concepts or new concepts like DDD introduced, it's very important to onboard uh, new developers as soon as possible and find a way to, to show and uh, to show piece of code, to show the practices you want to apply. Because a concept like DDD, if you look at over the internet, you will find tons of content and everyone will explain different point of view so you can easily get lost. And what I said be, uh, at Promise when we took some ideas, I don't pretend that if uh, I show my code, uh, our code at Promise to some DDD experts or around the world, I'm, I'm sure they will have uh, a lot of say, uh, a lot of things to say, uh, maybe some criticize about the, the, the code and so on, because I'm sure we can improve it. But I don't want to say uh, my code is fully compliant with all DDD concepts. Uh, my idea is, okay, what ideas I can take from DDDs and clean architecture and uh, why uh, I should apply these concepts uh, in my context um, and which, which goals uh, I would like to reach. And uh, for us, it was more about building more maintainable source code, uh, separate uh, concept, technical concept, and business logic concept. And uh, at least we managed to do it. So that's what I, I prefer to say. We, we, we took some ideas because when you, we, if you say we are using click arch uh, clean architecture on DDD, uh, you are sure that you will have an expert in the room and say, ah, show me if you will, your code. And I will say if you are compliant or so not, you are not using DDD. So <laughs> right. I just prefer to say, okay, I don't know if I'm using DDD, but uh, yeah, I just took some ideas and uh, took the, the freedom to adapt it in my context. <laughs> sure, sure. And I think the key is an, a knowledge sharing and you're, you're trying to share the knowledge within the team and from the teams within your team as well to kind of better the process. I think that's the most important thing because um, working within the community and getting the help from um, all of the other experts can always improve um, the code yep. base and also the, the the technical patterns and so on. And and also, um, I think we briefly talked about it before, which was, uh, you know, if, if you're in a team that, for instance, uses DDD concept or there is a champion within the team who wants to implement this, what if that champion leaves for whatever reason? And then what? You know, that kind of thing as well. So you, you have the basic, uh, the foundation within your code source to help the rest of the developers to move forward with the project so that the, the project doesn't all of a sudden become paralyzed 
if one person who was the quote unquote expert within the team leaves or decides to take on a different route, right? Exactly. Um, so that's really important. And I wanted to just at a um, we're we're kind of coming to the end of our our time together, but I want to also emphasize that um, this is the your the Promise extension is language agnostic, and it's also IDE agnostic as well, right? So you can use it with any of your IDEs of you know choice or any language of choice. Is, is that correct? Yes. Are there uh, any are, limitations? Yeah, we, we are working yeah with any kind of programming language. So we have even teams today that use Promise in COBOL. And so basically, yeah, you want to, we want to support. Any oh, we're going way back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, and about the IDEs, we support uh, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, all the JetBrains uh, tools, mm -hmm. and also Eclipse. So okay, uh, not totally IDE agnostic, but we cover, I think, most of the IDEs developers use uh, today. Yes. The most popular ones, which is really yes, nice. Exactly. Great. Excellent. Um, where can folks find Promise? And use it. Uh, How can they use it? You can just go on uh, promise.com, so p r o m y z e dot com, and uh, you can just start the experience for free because we have a freemium version. So in uh, one minute, you can be ready to create your <laughs> first coding standards and uh, run first uh, workshops with your team to discuss uh, your your coding practices. And uh, I really encourage to do it because even even if you don't yeah, pay for Promise and so on, but just spend one hour or 40 minutes with uh, all developers in your team to discuss and debate about your coding standards. Uh, maybe this is something you never did before and uh, the exercise is really worth it. So I just encourage to at least do this. Uh, I think it- Do a little POC on it. Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> exactly. Fantastic. I will uh, put down the link in the um, notes of- uh, our podcast so that everybody can take a look and uh, try it out. And there are some videos that folks can watch. They're super helpful, short videos that yes, people can look website, and see yeah. yeah, on the website, which is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cedric, for joining me today. This was really insightful. And uh, thank you for all your efforts. Really thank great you. job. Yeah, thank you. I was really happy to be there. And uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you. Sarah. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Have a good day as well. See you very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Cedric. Please join me next time for other amazing conversations with wonderful guests. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.